Okay, this is the second lecture of uh, the, the module on polymer characterization. Um, so I want to continue adding to the ways we can characterize polymers. And one of those ways is what's called isomerism. And isomerism is just saying that there's there can be compounds with the same chemical formula but different atomic arrangements. And it's easiest to see this by, by illustrating example. Uh, and so we'll look at CHH18. So if we were to draw this in sort of a, a typical fashion, we could draw it just as a is a um, straight carbon backbone with hydrogens coming off of it, and that would be normal octane. We could write that in compact form, uh, as I've shown here, where we talk about all the chains uh, and we just give them a, a subscript number for all these CH2s that exist in the middle of this uh, molecule. But there are other ways to arrange these atoms as well. Uh, and this, this is 2,4-dimethylhexane. Uh, and as you can see, the the uh, the composition is the same. There's still eight carbon atoms and 18 hydrogen atoms, but the structure that they arrange themselves in is very different. And the reason that's important is because the properties of a polymer are going to depend on the isomeric state. So you can't just take the chemical formula and know what the what the um, properties and behavior of that polymer will be. You have to uh, know the actual the the isomeric state that that polymer is in. There are two uh, sort of subcategories of isomerism. One is called stereoisomerism, and we we, introdu we introduce this a concept called tacticity uh, uh, with respect to this type. All stereoisomerism is it says that the repeat units are linked together in the same order. So if you can imagine your repeat unit being um, like we've shown for uh, you know, a general case for a hydrocarbon, then they can just link head to tail, head to tail, head to tail, for example, would be the repeats units linked together in the same order. The tacticity is how the R units along the chain are arranged. So, so, so let me just briefly talk here. So we have this, this region right here would be a repeat unit. So with two carbons, three hydrogens, and this R group. And so you can see they're stacked in the same order, right? So uh, head to, so this is the tail and uh, this is the head. This is, they're stacked head to tail, head to tail along, along this um, chain. Uh, if all the R groups reside on the same side of the chain, we call that isotactic. If in contrast, they are alternating on the side, so this, monomer we have an r on this side and then in the connecting monomer we have an r that that's on the other side of the chain we call that syndiotactic um, and then there's a there's a third group called atactic which is just where all the r groups are randomly positioned in the chain so stereoisomerism is one type of isomerism a second type is uh, geometric isomerism and this specifically occurs uh, when we have a repeat unit that incorporates a double bond so I'll, I'll define the terms and then I'll show you an example but there's a cis structure uh, and all that is is that there's it, it's it, um, tells you how the how the H atom in the structure and the R group are oriented on with respect to the chain. So if they're on the same side of the chain, it's a cis structure. If they're on opposite sides of the chain, we call that a trans structure. So we can look at, for example, polyiso uh, polyisoprene and the cis structure. So let me let me just draw go back here. This is this this is a repeat unit. There's a carbon a carbon double bond. We go to a CH2 there. You can imagine I could create uh, bond it to exactly the same other uh, repeat unit and create a chain. Uh, in this case, uh, we have the, the the R group is the CH3, and then we have a hydrogen. They're on the same side of the chain, so it's called a cis structure. Uh, in contrast, we go to a trans structure. Now you can see that. The hydrogen exists on the opposite side from the R group, in this case CH3, and we call that a trans structure. So this uh, polyisoprene, uh, in this case, forms natural rubber, and in this case, it forms something called gutta percha. So the interesting thing is that uh, the, even something as simple as this also changes the properties. Uh, you might create 
a rubber band out of this uh, natural rubber, whereas the gutta percha is what we uh, s sometimes use in root canal fillings. So obviously uh, not, not the same uh, uh, properties. Okay, so that's that's how uh, that sort of ends the discussion of how molecular structure characterization um, uh, uh, breaks down for polymers. We want to move to talk now about uh, other types of characterizations. So we can classify polymers also on the basis of how they respond to force at elevated temperatures. And so we break these quantities into what are called thermosets and thermoplastics. So a thermoplastic uh, is something that softens, and it actually you can melt it and liquefy it when it heat when it's heated. Uh, it will uh, harden when it's cooled, and this process can be reversible and repeatable. So as a result, you can typically recycle these. So if you uh, want to create something new, you just melt it down and and rebuild it. Um, this is these. Thermoplastics are usually linear or branched polymers, and the reason that they behave this way is because the the heat uh, just allows those van der Waals bonds that are uh, bonding the chains together to break, and and so they can move around like a liquid. And then if we cool them down, they'll reform and form into whatever structure we want. So uh, typical examples of these would be polyethylene, polystyrene, um, uh, and and these other uh, that I'm showing you here. Uh, so let me let me give you a, just a quick example. So this is uh, pulling nylon out of a liquid, right, where it's a nylon liquid. And as it cools, it actually forms a solid. So that would be a typical example uh, of a thermoplastic. Um, now, thermosets, in contrast, are um, pretty much the opposite. So they are going to become permanently hard during processing. They don't soften up during heating, and you can't recycle them because you can't reverse or repeat the process. And the reason for this is that they're usually cross-linked and networked polymers. And so unlike the easy-to-break van der Waals bonds, these chains are bonded, bonded together by covalent bonds, which, which don't break readily and certainly don't break and form a liquid and then reform uh, easily. So these classes of materials would be your rubbers, epoxies, and sort of phenolics. Um, and, and these are just examples. There's others. So let me show you. Uh, this is a. Uh, this is actually yours truly. Uh, when I was building my house, I was looking at some of the foam material that I was using to, uh, to, uh, for fire retardant in in my uh, chimney uh, chase. So I'll I'll play it for you. I, I basically want to put a blowtorch to it and show you that it obviously doesn't melt. Okay, this is a test of the spray foam. This test is fire retardancy. This is not safe. Never do this at home. The answer is it's not fire retardant. But however, it doesn't seem to burn very long, does it? So you've now seen why I'm not a uh, experimentalist as well. But the bottom line is that just chars when we, when we um, uh, heat it. Okay, uh, uh, one other uh, category of characteristics, and we've briefly mentioned these before when we separated homopolymers from copolymers, but there's subcategories of copolymers. So remember that a copolymer is a polymer that's made of two or more monomer types. And so in this, these pictures, uh, the, the, the black atoms that are, yeah, the black atoms correspond to, um, let's say type A, monomer and the red atoms might correspond to type B monomer. And so there are basically four categories that we want to be familiar with of copolymers. One is the random one, which is just the A and B monomers are randomly positioned in the chain. The other is alternating where A and B are going to exactly alternate along the chain to form the polymer uh, as a whole. And then a third is called a block copolymer. And that's where the A and B are both along the chain, but they typically group together in blocks along that chain. And then finally, uh, the, the, the last category of copolymers is a graft copolymer. And that's where we have a backbone that is A, and then we have uh, these, these uh, branches that are gra of B that are grafted onto A. So those are the four uh, main categories of copolymers that you need to uh, be familiar with. Okay, one final um, 
a categorization or a characterization that's relevant for polymers, and that's crystallinity. So, in, you know, we're, we've talked a lot in this class about metal crystallinity, and, it, you know, we we know that that repeat structure goes on, you know, uh, forever, basically, until we hit a grain boundary. Um, it's a little different in polymers. So we, we just are going to say polymer crystallinity is basically the packing of chains to produce some ordered array. And so what I'm showing you here on the left is just a, um, a potential or a possible polyethylene unit cell. Um, and then we could have even more complex structures. This is called a chain folded structure. And what you can see here is you have this these folds of a polymer chain, and they, they do this with regularity to form sort of a layer uh, inside the polymer. But one unique feature about polymers in contrast to metals or, or ceramics typically is that polymers can only be semi-crystalline. They are never completely crystalline. Um, but the regions that are crystalline are usually going to be more dense, they're going to be more tightly packed than the regions that are amorphous. So as a result, you can define the percent crystallinity for a polymer uh, based on the densities. So this formula, this is just taken out of your book, uh, it's, it's a way to calculate crystallinity just by, uh, how, just by a ratio of uh, some density terms, where this rho sub s is the density of the total specimen, uh, rho sub a is the density of any am amorphous region in that specimen, and then rho sub c is the density of the, the crystalline uh, region. Uh, so that's that's how we uh, compute crystallinity, but it's something that's a little bit different than what we're used to because when we have a metal, it's it's 100% crystalline, whereas a polymer won't be. Um, a couple things that you might note or might be able just to surmise uh, intuitively is that uh, crystallinity is going to occur typically in chemically simple polymers. And you can imagine that the more complex and convoluted the polymer is, the harder it is to form nice repeatable patterns. It's going to be much easier if the molecule is simple, like polyethylene. Um, and then the final thing I want to say about crystallinity is that the crystallinity of the polymer is going to be affected by the thermal processing. If you cool something really quickly, then the polymer doesn't have time to move and to, f and to form the crystalline structures that it might want to ordinarily. Um, and so... Uh, how the, the rates at which you process that are, is going to affect uh, the crystallinity of the polymer. And of course, crystallinity of the polymer is going to influence the mechanical behavior of the polymer, among other things. So um, that's the last thing I wanted to talk about with respect to polymer characterization. Uh, going forward, we're going to talk about uh, polymer processing and manufacturing techniques uh, and uh, go from there.